In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On Monday this week, we began to look at what I called the bafflement of Pontius Pilate. Pilate's growing uncertainty and unease about the dialogue in which he is engaged with Jesus of Nazareth. Pilate begins not quite seeing why Jesus is any of his business, and gradually begins to understand obliquely, rather inconclusively, that this beaten and vulnerable man in front of him is in fact everyone's business. St. John depicts very effectively that growing depth of unease in Pilate, the finger of ice which Pilate feels on his spine at certain moments as he realizes how deeply he has miscalculated what is before him. And that icy unease becomes more and more sharply focused around the issue of how we define power, royalty, and authority. St. John weaves some of his most complex ironies around this topic in the account of Jesus before Pilate. At first, it is perfectly clear to Pilate that this would-be king of the Jews can pose him no challenge. In the terms that Pilate understands, Jesus of Nazareth has no forces to support him. It's probably worth remembering that Pilate was not unused to having rebels in his court. We know from our historical sources that he had plenty of experience of the brutal suppression of insurgencies in Judea. He must have met a good many revolutionaries who would no doubt have spat in his face and cursed him as they died and promised the revenge of their supporters. Clearly, Jesus of Nazareth is very under-resourced in this department. Stalin's famous question, how many divisions has the Vatican, would be one that Pilate would recognize immediately. So, no, this is a revolutionary king who does not threaten the power that Pilate exercises in the way Pilate exercises it. But instead of this lessening Pilate's unease, it deepens it. Here again, see the skill of St. John's narrative. Because Pilate begins to realize that he is not engaged in a competition with Jesus, which he, Pilate, is going to win, because he has the big battalions. He is confronting an order of power and rule totally alien to anything he knows how to cope with. This is power of another sort. And instead of that being less threatening, it is more threatening. When it might look for a moment as though Jesus is just another competitor for political power in Judea, Pilate can shrug it off. He knows he's going to win. But what if what is before him is something which makes nonsense of all his own claims, all his own resources, all his own understanding of how he governs and negotiates the world. What if this is another world, another kingdom? And what if, as we reflected on Monday, what if that other world and other kingdom is in fact the most unwelcome news of all, the one that Pilate has been living in all the time without ever noticing it? What if, to put it very simply, the universe is not on Pilate's side. No wonder Pilate begins to panic. 
contrast the question he begins with in St. John's narrative, the sneering question to the Jews, do you take me for one of you? With the panicky, whispered, where do you come from? Which he hisses at Jesus as the interrogation becomes more intense. Jesus does not compromise. Yes, if you want to call me a king, you can. Yes, if you want to ascribe power to me, by all means do. But understand what that power is and is not. Understand that it is not from hence. Jesus presents to Pilate a power that is not the result of a power struggle. Power that is not the result of somebody winning and somebody else losing. Power that resides simply in transparency to the truth. Simply in reality. What Jesus has to say to Pilate is that all the varieties of power with which Pilate is familiar are the results of these processes of winning and losing. Pilate, you might say, has been lucky. He has so far won. And once again, with a sidelong glance at the historical sources, within about three years, he was about to lose rather spectacularly. But, says Jesus, when Pilate tells him he has power over him, but you would have no power at all over me unless you were bound up in a complicated world of political horse trading and competition and struggle. There is nothing necessary, nothing intrinsic in your power. Now you see it, now you don't. Pretend as long as you like that it is invulnerable to change and chance, but the truth will catch up with you. And, says Jesus, it is that truth that I am here to show you. A power which does not compete, coerce, or destroy. Don't you know I could kill you? Says Pilate. Jesus shrugs it off. Your power to kill is one of the things that happens in those complicated negotiations of earthly power. You have the right to kill me in your world. Others may have the right to kill you when you lose. But it's not from there that my power comes. Or to put it more starkly still, Pilate has the power to kill. Jesus has the power to make alive. There perhaps is the very heart of it. All the way through St. John's Gospel, the power of Jesus to make alive is what our attention is drawn back to. A kind of power which has nothing to do with winning and losing. How on earth could any mortal human being acquire the power to make alive? That is a power which is indeed not from hence, not the result of struggle and effort and temporary fragile success, not a power that's maintained by clinging by the fingernails to the window edge. And so this encounter, which focuses the nature of power, speaks to us about the power we understand and even try to exercise and manifest in the body of Christ, in the community of faith. The power of Jesus is twofold. It is the sheer power of truth. Here is a life which flings open the doors to reality itself. This is how it is. This love, this gift, this vulnerability, this is in the most capital letters you can imagine, how it is. And our own games of winning and losing, our own games 
of advantage and disadvantage, success and failure, are irrelevant. We may temporarily be on top of one heap or another, but that is not how it is. And the second dimension of this is that because of this, it is life that is in question, the power, the liberty to give life. And in one of those wonderful verbal tricks that St. John so loves, in the very first chapter of his gospel, St. John speaks of us receiving the power to become children of God. And as soon as you put it in those terms, you see how the presence of Jesus explodes the ways in which we speak of power. What kind of power is it to receive, not to control, not to end life, not to build walls and set boundaries, but the power to grow into truth, into reality. The kingship of Jesus, the royal power he manifests in this extraordinary moment depicted for us by St. John before Pilate, that is the power that belongs to how things are. The reality that is in Jesus, the love and the mercy and the life-giving that is in Jesus is the very grain of things, the very energy that holds things together. It is as unarguable as the law of gravity. It is the force of what can't be denied or escaped. No wonder Pilate feels the cold finger on his spine. What if everything he thinks he knows about himself and his world is wrong? What if his world of competition, power and weakness, winning and losing, is in fact a world that is grating against the very grain of reality. What if? And in the body of Christ, how do we live out the power that belongs to Jesus? If I say, patchily, that is a polite understatement. <laughs> because there is our own kind of gravitational power at work. The gravitational power of ego and fear, which draws us back again and again to Pilate's world and Pilate's power. We all ought to be heartbroken when we see how readily that happens. How often at the moment are we reading about the problems of bullying in the church, the misuse of authority at one level or another. Every preacher ought to be aware that whenever they stand in the pulpit, there will be before them some members of a congregation who have experienced Pilate's power at work in the church and who are aware of their own danger in sitting where they sit. And how it ought to break our hearts when we see, as we see on the other side of Europe, a church invested in the power of the state, not merely the power of the state to control, but the power of the state to invade and slaughter. Pilate and Jesus still confront one another. And our tragedy is that they confront one another not in some distant courtroom in first century Judea, but in our hearts as believers, in our heart as a community and an institution. Tomorrow, I hope to be thinking with you a little bit about what it is like to grow in the body of Christ, to be fed so as to grow. But today, as we reflect on that last round of the confrontation between the governor and the peasant, between the killer and the life giver. Today we are called to think 
about our own willingness to grow into the power of Jesus. To grow into that holiness, which is simply the letting through of the unarguable reality of the action, the energy that makes and holds all things. Can we trust God sufficiently to let that be in us and to let it show in our acts and words and faces? Most of the time, no, we can't. That's why we need Holy Week every year, to bring us to our knees and our senses, to recognize that the kingdom we inhabit is not of this world, and that the power of its king is not the result of some process of struggle, victory over others and at the expense of others, but the bare fact of a life flung open to truth. Fling wide the gates. One of those dramatic phrases that occurs in Stainer's crucifixion at the beginning of a particularly flashy piece of composition. <laughs> but fling wide the gates is one of those texts, one of those slogans, which ought to be in our minds and hearts day after day in Holy Week. Each year, we have the summons and the opportunity to fling open our lives to that transparency to the truth in which alone is the power to create and give and nourish life itself, the life of God in us, the life that is love and generosity and mercy. May God give us the key to open the gates of our own hearts to that truth.